1992, practicing general neurosurgery, specialty in brain and complex spine. Um, and I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight during a week night with basketball and all the other distractions. And I applaud all of you for coming um, and, and having the curiosity to sort of uh, have an open mind and listen to what is really going to be transformative as we go through life. Because our relationship with wireless technology is probably never going to be the same once you have this awareness of what you're going to hear tonight. A couple of housekeeping things are in order. Um, in consideration of those people that are here who are electrohypersensitive, and you'll learn about what electrohypersensitivity is, please turn your cell phones either off or into airplane mode so that the cell phone is not actually sending or receiving. It's not seeking a cell phone tower. It's not connecting to Wi-Fi. It will not be connecting to Bluetooth. And by not having that phone on, it will not send any signals to anybody else in the audience. If you are on call for some reason or have to be reachable, then please leave it in vibrate mode and move to the periphery, like in the back or on the sides, so that those people who are sensitive to um, these um, electrofrequencies aren't affected. So, quickly. Why, as a neurosurgeon, would I be interested in electromagnetic safety? Why would I be, you know, kind of taking this on as a cause celeb for myself? And the answer is that as a science evidence-based person, I've always been very interested in technology, but I've always questioned the safety of technologies. And we used to joke as younger neurosurgeons, as cell phones came into the fore, as residents during our training that we would see, oh, we would laugh and say, we'll probably see more brain tumors. And that was a hypothetical. And the sad reality is, is that now this is, this is indeed the case. And we have documentation from leading neurosurgeons in the international, with international reputations far more um, widely held than myself in terms of brain tumor research, um, one of whom is Charlie Teo in Australia and there are others who've gone on record, uh, have made YouTubes and TED Talks about the relationship between um, electrofrequencies and brain tumors. And then just recently, um, at a conference I was at, the U of A, in a preliminary study, released an abstract showing that meningiomas that are a benign tumor of the brain lining are now occurring with a higher malignancy rate in a younger population. And so we know for a fact that we are now exposed to 100 thousand times radio frequencies in our environment than we were exposed to decades ago. And without going into a lot of great detail, um, I think my wife and I have been affected and we've noticed some changes just in terms of what we've done in the last three months to mitigate and lessen our exposure. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Kelly who will introduce our guest speaker this evening. Elizabeth is the founder and director of the Electromagnetic Safety Alliance located here in Tucson. The purpose of the ESA is to raise awareness, educate, and advocate on the risks posed to mankind and nature from artificial sources of electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic radiation used for electricity, wireless communications. Elizabeth also manages an appeal organization to the United Nations and the World Health Organization and is now signed, this is, has been signed, this appeal has been signed by 247 scientists in 42 nations, all of whom have published peer-reviewed EMF papers and science journals reporting biological and health effects at levels far below national, international standards. And so this is not hyperbole, this is not hypothetical, this is data. Um, Elizabeth has been a lightning rod here in the community, speaking locally, nationally, and at an international level. Um, she advises the Pima County 5G Awareness Coalition. She was the co-founder of an international EMF alliance based in Norway and formerly served as the managing director for the International Commission of Electromagnetic Safety based in Italy. Elizabeth, please come up. We'd love to have you introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Halil. I am so overwhelmed and, and pleased that 
we're all here together at night uh, tonight and I want to thank Khalil and Jenny for bringing us the idea and pitching it and of course we said yes and so I'm glad you're all here I hope you enjoy the evening and learn a lot and go away with some ideas in mind of things you could do to protect yourself and your loved ones I want to tell you a little about myself before I introduce Magda I'm the daughter of an electrical engineer. He ran Los Angeles Water and Power. And so I grew up with a dad who was always looking after the water system, the power system, and talking about system designs and surges and uh, nuclear power and, boat and dams and, uh, and uh, steam plants and everything else. We took vacations into the desert to look at the high power transmission lines. We took tours of Boulder Dam many, many times. So that was kind of my life. And he was also involved in the Arizona Water Project. Um, I also have worked in public health for most of my working life. I worked at the US Department of Health and Human Services. So I had a public health background. And I had a general awareness about safety because of my dad. But it wasn't until 1993 that I started to notice that there could be a problem with wireless tech. I was in DC. We had a baby in our home. And I uh, was trying to do a little real estate sales on the side. And uh, a little flip phone came out that was a lot better than the phone I had wired into my car. So I bought it. I was an early adapter. And I'd drive around with the windows up with high, therefore, more intense signal around me. Um, doing business. Uh, but I started to notice pretty early on that I didn't feel well when I was doing this. In fact, my heart would start racing. I would feel flushed. I'd have to pull over sometimes by the side of the road to catch my breath. And I thought, what's going on here? So I went home and got on the internet. They did have internet in 1993, you know. And what I learned got me to take action to protect my own health and my young child's health. I uh, got rid of the phone. I got rid of the cordless phones. I got rid of the microwave oven. I had been carrying my child around in my arms on my cordless phone. So, and in the kitchen with the microwave running, you know, I was, was not aware. But I took those precautions and my symptoms went away. And then I realized that I did a good thing. But three years later, my child was in preschool. We were in California. And I learned my church was going to put a cell tower on the roof. And I said, now, wait a minute. We need to take a look at this. So I used my public policy skills, and I did an investigation. And I learned that that cell tower was one of the first of 250,000 that we now have in this country. What are they hiding? This is unconstitutional. Um, I took action right away. That's what got me involved, and that's what keeps me going, because we still have that preemption. And now we have many more with fifth generation wireless, and we'll get to that later. But that's what got me going, and that's why I continue. Um, I'm very glad to do this work. It's, it's my passion. I'm committed to it. I don't know whether in my lifetime I'll see everything remedied, but I'd like to leave the world a better place. So. With that, I'd like to introduce Magda. Magda Havas has, a, PhD, has a, a bachelor's degree in biology, a PhD in environmental science, and she's an environmental toxicologist with a whole career worth of looking at various toxins. She started working on this issue a little about 25 years ago, and she's done a lot of research on the biological and health effects of electricity and of wireless, electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic radiation. She's published over 200 papers. And she has given presentations over 360 times to 30 in 30 nations. She advises um, government agencies. She's presented to government agencies around the world. She advises NGOs. She's an advisor to my campaign to the United Nations for the International EMS Science Appeal. And she's a wonderful friend and a dedicated person. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy what she has to say, and, and I think you'll learn a lot, too. So with that, I'd like to introduce Magda.
Thank you very much, Libby, for that uh, introduction. Like Libby, I'm very passionate about this issue, and it's become my life's work. Um, I recently retired uh, from Trent University, and uh, I'm still very active in trying to help raise awareness, educate people, um, so that we can do something to really improve the planet. So what I'd like to do is show you um, a series of slides. Um, this talk was really very difficult for me to put together because Libby asked me, can you cover everything? <laughs> and um, of course I can't, but I'm, I've tried. So I've set my alarm for 45 minutes, so I'll try to finish within that time. Anyway, the title of this talk is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly uh, of Electromagnetic Exposure. <clears throat> and just to let people know, I'm from Canada. Uh, I live in Peterborough, which is a small community, about 75,000. And I used to teach at Trent University, which is an absolutely beautiful campus with uh, a river running through it. You can see that there. I retired in October of last year. Um, and the name of my lab is called the Rose Lab. Rose was my mother's name. Uh, so I named it after her, but it actually stands for Research of Subtle Energy. And I actually uh, have continued doing education. I have the Havis Academy of Electromagnetic Health and Hygiene and periodically give workshops to different groups that want to learn more about this radiation. And this is uh, part of my lab, uh, just to let you know. Uh, we have a lot of equipment there, and I do research on both the harmful effects of electromagnetic pollution. I also became interested about um, 10 years ago in the beneficial effects of electrotherapy. And uh, I don't have time to talk about this now, but I'm hoping Libby will invite me back because we're learning an amazing amount of um, interesting information on how to help people heal using electrotherapy. Now, electrosmog is a form of air pollution, and just like we have the Los Angeles smog that we can see on occasion, uh, with electromagnetic radiation, because you can't see it, people think that it doesn't exist. We have uh, sources within the home that produce electrosmog, and we have sources outside the home that produce electrosmog. And these outside the home sources actually penetrate brick. That's why you can use your cell phone indoors. So it actually comes through the walls, the, the windows, uh, the ceiling in your home. There are different sources of electrosmog, cell towers, cell phones, Bluetooth, cordless phones, wireless baby monitors, Wi-Fi, and the uh, paraphernalia that goes with them, as well as smart meters. All of these emit microwave radiation. And the more of this technology that you have in your home, um, the higher your exposure, and the more likely that you will eventually become ill from the radiation. And there are different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that have been associated with ill health. One is low frequency electromagnetic fields. Here it's primarily from power lines, wiring in your home, and electric equipment. And what's been associated with this in the literature is primarily childhood cancer, particularly leukemias and lymphomas and brain tumors in children. We then have radio frequency microwave radiation, and this is from wireless technology, and I'll be talking primarily about this form of radiation. We also have something called ground current um, that affects um, has been was first noticed on farms because it affects cattle um, and because cattle are uh, milked cows are milked um, the amount of milk they produce is directly in proportion to the amount of ground current pollution in the area the ground current pollution is becoming so bad that people are actually affected it's in a lot of communities now and the government doesn't know how to get rid of it um, because it's becoming so severe and finally, there's something called dirty electricity. Uh, and this comes from electronic devices and is biologically active. And it's, there's simple ways of getting rid of it. And I do research in all of these four areas uh, of electrosmog. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to limit my talk to just the two up top, dirty electricity and radio frequency radiation. Now, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and it you can see here that um, the frequencies, they're called hertz. Can you see this now? No. Uh, the frequencies at the bottom are one hertz, which means one cycle per second, and they increase as we go up the electromagnetic spectrum. 
different parts of the spectrum have been given different names to help scientists, uh, scientists communicate about them. At the very bottom is extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields. We then have microwave radiation near the top. Um, and in between we have what's called poor power quality or dirty electricity. And most of the research has actually been done on microwaves and the low frequency. There's been very little research on dirty electricity. The 5G, the fifth generation technology that's being unrolled or rolled out as we uh, speak uh, is in that part of the spectrum. It's a radio frequency, it's a microwave frequency, but it's called millimeter waves. That's how they refer to it. Now, our exposure to electromagnetic pollution has increased dramatically, and one of the best ways for me to show this is to look at uh, the uh, deployment of Wi-Fi. And you can see in this particular graph little purple dots uh, for the United States. And those are areas that have Wi-Fi uh, transmitters. Most of them are universities, government institutions, um, uh, military uh, locations. And that was in 2002. So you can see there's really very little uh, Wi-Fi back in 2002. This is what it looks like in 2018, so just last year. We've moved from um, very little to blanketing wireless radiation through Wi-Fi in just a period of 16 years, which is really very disturbing. At the same time, we have an increase in chronic illnesses. Many of the ones that we have listed here, actually every single one of the ones I have listed here, uh, has been associated with electromagnetic exposure. I'm going to... Um, really focus on three different parts of the research that's been done. The bioeffects of electromagnetic fields, they fall into three basic categories. One is cancer, the other is reproductive problems, and the third are neurological problems that we collectively call electrohypersensitivity, or EHS. I'm going to start with reproduction. There have been now about 24 different studies showing that uh, cell phone radiation affects sperm. So the men in the audience really shouldn't keep their cell phones in their pocket because that cell phone is giving out a signal every few minutes connecting with a tower and that's um, e exposing your genital area to microwave radiation. And I'm just going to show you, I'm not going to do that particular study, but I'm going to show you uh, live sperm and how it's affected by 2.4 gigahertz frequency, which is the same frequency we use for Wi-Fi. The top two uh, slides there are uh, control conditions, so there's no RF exposure. The bottom two slides are exposed. And in the top, this is after one hour uh, after the sperm was released. Um, you can see that they're moving around uh, a little confused because they don't know where to go. They're on a glass plate right now. Uh, at the bottom, this is one hour exposure after irradiating them uh, with 2.4 gigahertz frequencies. And then on the right, that's five hours later. And I think one of the things you can see is in the bottom right slide, those sperm aren't doing well at all. And that's only after five hours of exposure to 2.4 gigahertz, which is Wi-Fi. Anyone who has a laptop computer on their lap in Wi-Fi mode, uh, keeps a cell phone in their pocket, is likely to damage sperm. One of the primary concerns is that laptop on Wi-Fi in your pocket because you're going to have it there for a long period of time. And every time it's downloading or uploading information, it's emitting microwave radiation. Now, women have been born with all the aches they'll ever produce. So if you damage the aches, you've damaged that woman's ability to reproduce. With men, the eggs, the sperm, are reproduced every three months, roughly. And so my advice to young men who want to get pregnant eventually um, is to not have their cell phone on their body for at least three months prior to getting their partners pregnant uh, because you can then regenerate the sperm and have fresher, better quality sperm. Some very disturbing information came out. This is a study that was published in 2008 and it was picked up uh, by the independent newspaper in the United Kingdom. Uh, Jeffrey Lane is um, a really good reporter who's reported on this a number of times. And you can see here a pregnant woman who's got a laptop in Wi-Fi mode, and she's also talking on her cell phone. 
and that's potentially affecting the fetus. And what the results of this particular study show is that the offspring from women who are exposed to this radiation, they have emotional difficulties, inattention, hyperactivity, and problems with peers that begin to be noticed when they're about six or seven years of age. And we know that there are so many children now who have attention deficit disorder, attention hyperactivity disorder, and including autism. And there's research showing that um, at least part of the increase in autism could be due to microwave uh, radiation. Now, this is a quote I came up with, and someone asked me to repeat it a few times because they really liked it, so I'm going to put it here. A society that doesn't protect its children doesn't have a future. And we're doing a really bad job protecting our children. Um, they're coming down with cancers at an earlier age. They have all sorts of learning disabilities. Um, students in school are incredibly anxious. I have a lot of teacher friends who tell me that, and certainly at the university where I was teaching, um, the anxiety level among the student population has grown enormously. So that's uh, about reproduction. Uh, the next topic I'd like to cover is cancer, and I'm going fairly quickly because I want to finish within the 45 minutes available to me. I've, I'm good with water. So I'd like to talk about cancer, and this is partly because of Hillel as well, uh, because he's a neurosurgeon and interested in this. The evidence that we have for cancers comes from different sources. One are cell phone studies. Another source are uh, laboratory experiments, mostly with rats. And um, the other is uh, studies, epidemiological studies of people who happen to live near towers. And this could be a cell phone tower or a broadcast antenna, or they could be living near an airport or a military base where they have radar. And all of those studies are basically showing the same thing. In 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a branch of the World Health Organization, classified radiofrequency radiation as a possible human carcinogen. And this was based on two primary sources of information. One was the interphone study that I'll talk about in a minute, and the other was laboratory studies uh, with rats and mice. <clears throat> the interphone study, one of the publications that came out in 2011, showed that there was an increase in gliomas and meningiomas uh, for people who use cell phones. The increase varies from paper to paper, but it generally shows up after about 10 years of exposure. Um, and in this particular case, it shows a 180% increase in risk. For meningiomas, um, it's after seven years of exposure with a 100% increase in the development um, of meningiomas. And both of these tumors um, have been recorded over and over again, but the best information comes for gliomas. That's the one where it seems to be relatively consistent. Now, the cell phone industry, um, I think, is very much aware of this. And so what they've done is they have fine print where they tell you to keep the cell phone away from your body. Now, the print is so fine that I can't actually read it without a magnifying glass, um, but that's an increase in size, so you can see. And a lot of the manufacturers do this. Now, this should be good news, except most people don't recognize that this is what they're saying. And unfortunately, when it comes to lawsuits, they now have the ability to say in court, uh, did you use the cell phone the way it's recommended? Uh, did you ever hold it against your head? And if they say they had, then uh, basically they can get away with it because they said, well, we warned you not to. So it, this is sort of a double-edged sword. <clears throat> California Department of Public Health in 2014 was legally compelled to release information on cell phones. Um, so a lot of the information that's available through government agencies and health agencies has been suppressed. It's not being released. Uh, some of the agencies, like the EPA, they've lost the researchers they have that are doing this kind of research. Um, and a lot of the agencies, like the Federal Communication Commission that's responsible for setting guidelines, is really a captured agency. Uh, the people who are running the FCC are the same people who are running the wireless telecom industry. So they're not there to protect public health. They're there to protect the industry. Now, there's a different type of information. People will you know, often say, well, if cell phones were so bad and they were causing cancer, shouldn't we see a massive increase in brain tumors? And the answer is that hasn't happened. 
if you look at the literature and you look at the uh, statistics, brain tumors seem to be fairly uh, consistent. They're, they're not really increasing when you look at the data in its entirety. Now, this is a, a paper that was just recently published, 2018, by Alistair Phillips in the United Kingdom. And what they did is they looked at the period of 1995 to 2015, and they looked at the change in brain tumor incidence. And that's where this falls on the graph. The blue graph is the United Kingdom, and you can see that they were earlier doctors than here in America. Uh, this is the uh, cellular phone subscriptions per 100 people. And so by the time you get up to 100, then you're at basically saturated um, the market. And you can see here that the United States saturated the market by about 2012 or so. Now, if you look at the data that they present, um, they show the top graph where there's those are all malignant brain tumors. And you can see, if anything, perhaps a very slight increase. If you look at the green, these are low-grade tumors. And you can see that they're actually decreasing. But the red one, the glioblastoma multiforma, which is primarily um, uh, the uh, grade 4 tumor, uh, they're increasing. And it's this particular tumor that was picked up in rats. This is the tumor that's reportedly um, uh, documented in studies of cell phone users. So one type of tumor, glioblastoma multiforma, is increasing dramatically, not all of them. So when you look at all the brain tumors together, you end up with a relatively straight line. But when you start tearing the information apart, then you get something very different. This is also from the same paper in the United Kingdom. And here you can see um, the solid line are frontal and temporal lobe glioma blastoma multiforma. And that's the only one that's really increasing. So the temporal lobe, which is here, and the frontal lobe, which is here, gets the highest radiation when you hold a cell phone next to your head. Uh, very often, the studies are showing ipsilateral tumors, which means the tumor on the same side of your head that you hold the cell phone. So this is another bit of uh, data um, that's showing an increase in tumors. It turns out in California, there are three cancer registries. All three of them are showing an increase in glioblastoma multiforma uh, during roughly the same time period. Um, and they're finding it it's primarily in the temporal and frontal lobe. So once you start dissecting the data, then it really supports the concept that cell phones cause cancer. Now we use laboratory studies. With humans, when we do an epidemiological study, it just tells us there's an association between some agent and some consequence. So uh, using a cell phone um, is associated with brain tumors. It doesn't necessarily mean it causes brain tumors. And so laboratory studies are really critical that are done under totally controlled conditions because they're showing a cause-effect relationship um, if they show anything. Now, just last year, uh, the National Toxicology Program released a study looking at 900 megahertz frequency. Um, and this is the same frequency that tends to be used for um, smart meters. So this is a frequency that most of us or all of us are exposed to. And a few months later, that just came out this year, the Ramazzini study, this is an Italian study, where they looked at 1.8 gigahertz, so slightly different frequency, but both of them are cell phone frequencies that uh, we commonly use. And what they found, there was an increase in gliomas, an increase in schwannoma of the heart, and an increase in adrenal gland tumors. So the same tumor showing up in these animal studies, showing that there's a cause-effect relationship. Now, the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified this as a possible human carcinogen. And there are scientists internationally asking that it be reclassified to uh, either a, a possible, a probable carcinogen or carcinogenic to humans. And I think that's long overdue because of the massive um, exposure of the population. The last bit of evidence I'd like to provide about cell phones, about uh, cancer, are people who happen to live near cell phone antennas or broadcast antennas. This is a study that was done in Brazil. And what they found, um, they looked at distance from cell phone base stations and the rate of mortality from cancer. This isn't 
people getting cancer versus people dying from cancer, so it's even more severe. <clears throat> and you can see here, this is the distance from the base station, and this is the rate of uh, mortality per 10,000 individuals. The blue line represents the uh, risk of dying from cancer, and that's the null hypothesis, which means if you happen to live closer to the cell tower, um, it's, it's going to be identical if there's no effect of the cell tower on your cancer. And this is what they're actually finding. Sorry, what is what? It's a distance from the base station and it's in meters, sorry. Okay, so 100 meters, for example. Um, and so the closer you live to a base station, the more likely you are to die uh, from cancer. And what they're finding is the cancers are growing much more quickly. So you might be living near a base station for five years and your risk of dying from cancer actually has gone up quite considerably, even though most cancers have a longer latency period. Now, it seems to go up around 500, uh, at about 500 meters from the base station. The highest reading they recorded in this study was 41 microwatts per centimeter squared, and that's just power density, so that's, that's the intensity of the radiation. This is the highest they recorded in the study. The federal communication guidelines are 1,000. So 41 causes a problem, 1,000, okay, according to the U.S. government, for people to be exposed to. Now, this is the study in Brazil. Um, there was a study done in Israel, a study done in Germany with cell phone uh, towers, and you can see that the levels are really, really close. That seems to be a, beyond that seems to be a safe distance. So beyond 350 to 500 meters is probably safe. The last health effect I'd like to talk about is electrohypersensitivity. Um, and I just recently published a paper, it just came out two weeks ago, and it's called Electrohypersensitivity is an Environmentally Induced Disability that Requires Immediate Attention. And so we're really trying to get the world to recognize this as a problem, and certainly for doctors to recognize this as a problem, because they're having patients come to them who have a really weird set of symptoms, and many of the doctors just can't figure out what the problem is. Medication they give to these patients to get rid of their symptoms, whether it's a sleeping pill to help them sleep, or a painkiller, or some anti-anxiety, anti-depression medicine, isn't doing its job. These are the typical symptoms of electrohypersensitivity, and the ones that I have in the red box are the types of symptoms we develop as we age. And so I actually call it rapid aging syndrome. And very often when you talk to someone who has these symptoms, who doesn't believe they're electrically hypersensitive, come back and say, well, I'm just getting older, and it's common for older people not to be able to sleep, to have body aches and pains. But when these individuals go into an electromagnetically clean environment and stay there for a few days, a lot of those symptoms will disappear. So this isn't real aging, it's a rapid aging. I've done research with people who are electrically hypersensitive, mostly because I'm trying to figure out how to diagnose them um, and share that information with medical doctors. And we've come up with a few diagnostics that are really uh, quite interesting. I'm gonna talk about the blood, um, the, um, I didn't have the heart there. We've done some research on heart rate variability. Um, with respect to the blood, if you prick your finger and put it under a slide, you can actually look at your blood cells to see how they're doing. This is my blood, um, and this is in an environment that's relatively electromagnetically clean. I don't have wireless technology in my home or in my lab. And this is what happens to my blood when I expose to Wi-Fi for just 10 minutes. And when I've shown this to doctors, they gasp, and they can't believe I look as healthy as I do. Um, because just after a very short period of exposure, my blood cells are sticking together. This is called rouleau formation, and it prevents the, um, the blood from circulating properly, obviously, because it's, co it's coagulating a little bit. Um, there's problems with oxygen transport and waste removal from cells. Some of the symptoms for people who have this are headaches and fatigue, difficulty concentrating, numbness, tingling, and extremities 
heart and blood pressure problems, and in very severe cases, you can end up with a heart attack or a stroke if this is what happens to your blood and you have thin uh, blood vessels. So uh, not everyone who is electrically hypersensitive responds this way, but some percentage of the population do. And so by doing a very simple pricking of the finger, um, this might be a good diagnostic for electrohypersensitivity. And it's certainly something a doctor can do uh, in their clinic. When I first started learning about this, uh, a friend of mine was diabetic. He was actually pre-diabetic. And he told me that whenever he went into an environment that was electromagnetically polluted, um, that his blood sugar would rise. And I got all excited about this because measuring blood sugar is an objective way of documenting something. And so we began to work with diabetics and we published the research um, and I'll share it with you in a minute. Now, just as a reminder, there's two different types of diabetes. There's uh, type 1 diabetes, which is genetically um, induced, and there's uh, type 2 diabetes, which is primarily the type that we're concerned about because it affects such a large population. And it tends to occur in older people, not in the very young. I would like to suggest that there's another type of di diabetes that has an environmental trigger. And that trigger is radio frequency radiation in the form of dirty electricity. We published this research, dirty electricity elevates blood sugar uh, among uh, electrically sensitive diabetics. So you can be diabetic and electrically sensitive. And if you are, you're going to have difficulty controlling your blood sugar. We published four different cases uh, in this paper, and I'm just going to share with you one of them. This is a 57-year-old woman uh, from New York, and she's a type 2 diabetic, doesn't take any medication, controls her blood sugar with diet and exercise. And what you see here is the plasma glucose levels. In Canada, we use millimoles. You use milligrams per deciliter, so I have them uh, in both uh, languages. Um, and when she wants to control her blood sugar, she simply goes for a walk, 20 minute walk. And so this shows you her blood sugar before the walk and immediately after the walk. And ideally you wanna get it down to about 126 where that red line is. And these are on three different days. So you can see irrespective of what her starting blood sugar is, she can get it down to a, a good healthy level just by walking for 20 minutes. Now on some, t some days when um, you know it's raining outside or she just doesn't feel like going for a walk, she walks inside on a treadmill. And this is an example of what happens when she walks three different days to her blood sugar. So her blood sugar is actually going up despite the fact that she should be consuming the sugar because she's exercising. And so doctors who recommend that their patients exercise, and they don't really care if it's on a treadmill or outside, well, if that person is electrically sensitive, then they're doing a disservice to their body by wa walking on a treadmill. And the reason for that is treadmills produce dirty electricity and have a really high magnetic field. Now, um, if you answer yes to any of these questions, you might have type 3 diabetes. By the way, are there any diabetics in the population, in the audience here? Okay. And, you know, if you have difficulty controlling your blood sugar in certain environments, it possibly could relate to something like this. What can you do if you have type 3 diabetes? Well, you can have your home tested. Uh, you can minimize your exposure to electro smog. Uh, and you can share the information with your doctor. We really do have to educate the medical profession, uh, endocrinologists about this, because it's not something they learned in medical school. Uh, last example I'm going to give you of electrohypersensitivity is with multiple sclerosis. And many of you know it's a neurological disorder that deals with sclerosis in, in the um, brain or um, central nervous system. And depending on what part of the brain is affected, the symptoms will vary from person to person. There was a school in Wisconsin that had sick building syndrome. And uh, there were a number of kids who had asthma. Um, teachers complained about migraine headaches. Uh, uh, and they were really very upset with um, the school environment, thinking there was something there that was making them sick. Um, one summer, 
the school took their complaint seriously because I think the union was going to take action if they didn't. And they cleaned up the school. They got rid of the mold. They cleaned up all the uh, chemicals that they were using. They ripped out carpets. And the teachers and students came back and they were still sick. So there was something else in that school that was causing a problem. And it turned out to be dirty electricity. And they called in an electrician who came in, you know, measured it, cleaned up the problem. And what was really fascinating, there were something like 23, I, I, I can't remember, it might be 19 or 23 students in the school who had asthma. And they used their inhalers every single day at the school. And in that particular school, the school nurse kept the inhalers. So you would have to go in, sign in. And so she had a record of everyone who ever came in to use their own inhalers. And after the um, dirty electricity was cleaned up, these students stopped using, stopped going for their daily inhalation to clear up their uh, lungs and bronchi. And the parents called, for, you know, the, the parents had to pay for the inhalers. They had some at home, they had some at school. And mothers would call in and say, does Johnny need an, an inhaler? Do I have to buy two of them or is one sufficient? And the school nurse looked at her records and found that Johnny hadn't been coming in for several weeks to use his inhaler. He was still using it home in a dirty environment, dirty electromagnetic environment, but he no longer needed it at school. Now, the vice principal at that school had multiple sclerosis, and her symptoms, and she was so bad that she couldn't remember the name of her students after months of teaching them, and she had a class of about 30 or 25 students. And she just had all sorts of health problems, and she felt like she really had to quit teaching. She just couldn't do her job properly. After the dirty electricity was cleared up, her symptoms virtually disappeared. And she became incredibly enthusiastic about this and was trying to share the information with others. So I heard about this, and I started doing research with people who had MS. And this is a 27-year-old male who has primary progressive multiple sclerosis. We went to his home on November 24th uh, and asked him to walk. He, he used a walker, and you can see the railing on the side of the wall there. His parents installed that so he can actually uh, hold on to it when he walks. Uh, we put filters in. We cleaned up the dirty electricity. And he contacted me and told me, you know, I'm really doing well. And I thought, well, I have to go see it. So I went and visited him, and we videotaped him two weeks later. Huge difference. And he was so proud of this. He was actually outside shoveling the snow. He was showing off when I, when I arrived. Here's another woman, uh, another person with, um, this is secondary progressive MS. And when I was interviewing her, she was sitting on her hands. And I asked her why she was doing that. She says, well, my hands shake. So I asked if I could videotape them. This is on a loop, but basically she can't hold her hands straight. She can't feed herself. She couldn't go to the bathroom. Her mother took care of her during the day. Her husband took care of her at night. We put filters in. We cleaned up the dirty electricity. And this was six weeks later. And her mother told me that she could actually eat sandwiches on her own. So she improved enormously with no change in medication. So this is an example of how the environment can adversely affect your health. This is a person who had um, cleaned up his dirty electricity. Um, and in 2001, he had a brain scan. And you can see the sclerosis here. And this is seven years later. And the sclerosis is gone or it's disappearing. When the doctors looked at this, when, you know, he said, look, you doc, you know, this is what I'm doing, are you interested? They said, no, we're not. And when they looked at the scans, they said, oh, we must have made a mistake. Like, I don't know how you can make a mistake in a scan like that. Um, so you can see that there's much less sclerosis. So the body is able to heal itself. Now, the title of my talk was the good, the bad, and the ugly, and all I've done was bad stuff. <laughs> And I haven't done the good stuff yet. So uh, I'm going to now change to the ugly. What's really ugly about this? What's really ugly is the number of people where the percentage of the population that's adversely affected. Uh, I think that between 3 and 5% of the population have severe electro hypersensitivity to the point where they couldn't be in this particular room because of the microwave radiation we have. And by the way, 
I have a little meter here, and it's showing you that the levels are red and amber, which is extremely high to high. It should be green on this particular scale. So there are things in this room that are exposing us to microwave radiation. And the people who are sensitive, who are sitting here in the audience, are unfortunately going to pay the price of not feeling well uh, for a few hours to a few days after they go home. And that counts for about 3 to 5% of the population. I think probably 35% have mild to moderate symptoms. In Canada, we're talking about a million people who have severe electro hypersensitivity. In the US, we're talking about close to 10 million people. Your population is greater than that now. When I first did the slide, it was lower. In Europe, we're talking about 15 million people. So what's really ugly about this are the number of people who are already adversely affected. What really bothers me is what we're doing to infants. Simply because you can doesn't mean you should. This is um, Chinese technology. They're producing diapers with chips in them. And when the chip becomes wet, it sends the mother's cell phone a message saying, change, you know, baby's diaper. Totally frivolous uh, type of technology. And, you know, you're exposing that infant's entire body to microwave radiation. This is another one. This is a soother that has a thermometer inside the soother uh, that sends information to the mother's cell phone telling the mother what the infant's temperature is. So you've got a baby at home that's not feeling well. You put this in their, in their mouth, and you just simply walk around with your cell phone to find out, you know, is the temperature going up or down? Now, we recommend that people not hold cell phones to their head because of the radiation. Can you imagine putting that cell phone in your mouth, uh, in an infant's mouth? I mean, this is totally ludicrous, and this is really ugly. In North America, we have baby monitors, and parents who really care about their kids want to be aware of what the child is doing at all times, and so they put in these baby monitors. These baby monitors radiate 24-7. They're usually put close to the crib, so that infant is being irradiated um, all the time that that baby monitor is turned on. In Europe, they have sound-activated baby monitors, which means there's no radiation, the infant cries, the monitor turns on, sends the information to the parent, turns off again. We tried to bring those baby monitors to North America, and we were told we couldn't. We tried to bring cordless phones that have the same technology to North America, and we were told we couldn't. And that's because the Federal Communication Commission uh, prevents it from being brought here. And when you ask people who should know better uh, why that is, they say it interferes with telecommunication. How can something that doesn't radiate interfere with telecommunication? So we're really um, you know, told a, a whole bunch of lies when it comes to this. What's really ugly is that we're going to 5G. The antennas that are already being put up here in Tucson, um, they haven't yet been activated, but they're going to be activated very shortly. Um, and we're going to have a lot more radiation at a much higher frequency in front of, you know, every third or fourth home uh, in Tucson, which is really ugly. And unfortunately, there have been absolutely no long-term health studies uh, with respect to 5G technology. So we're exposing the entire population of the United States and of Canada, unfortunately, um, and we don't know what the consequences are going to be. This is in addition to all the technology we already have. So they're not going to take away the 4G um, or the 3G. They're simply going to add additional radiation. And my real concern is that we're going to have a massive increase in health effects, ranging from neurological disorders to cancer to reproductive problems. Now, I don't want to end on an ugly note. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the good things. The good thing is that you can protect yourself in your home. A lot of what you're exposed to in your home is likely to be um, because of the technology you have. So if you have cordless technology and you simply convert it to corded technology, um, you shouldn't have a problem. You could minimize your exposure enormously. In the top left there, we have a canopy. This consists of silver fiber. 
uh, coated by cotton and it produces a Faraday uh, cage over your bed. So if you happen to be in an environment where you can't control your exposure because it's coming from outside, then you can at least sleep in an electromagnetically clean environment. And you have to have that shield totally on top, around you, and beneath your bed as well to produce that uh, Faraday cage. There's paint that's available now that you can put on the walls. There's uh, uh, fabric um, that you can use for clothing. There's triple E glass that minimizes the radiation. So there's a lot of things now that you can do. You can see in the far right someone putting up just a uh, wire mesh to block the smart meter. And that would be enough to keep the radiation away from your home. And then you can filter for things like dirty electricity. Now, you can protect your body with silver, not jewelry, uh, but silver clothing. And they're making all sorts of things. Um, and I was hoping that someone could make me a burqa that I could wear um, just to sort of let people know uh, as a statement that um, uh, there are things that you can do. Now, some people who wear this technology tell me that makes them feel worse. So not everyone who's electrically sensitive can benefit from this. So you have to basically try it out uh, first. We have on my website um, electromagnetic hygiene and 12 easy steps. And this shows you uh, what you can do to protect yourself. And anyone can go to my website and download this. And we can put it on Libby's website as well if she's willing to, uh, so you can get information on that. Now, I'd like to end by saying, you know, health is our greatest uh, possession. It's really important we protect ourselves, and the best way to do that is by getting educated, by learning about this, and by doing something. So I'm hopeful that everyone in this uh, audience will take this seriously, do something to protect themselves, their friends, their family, um, and their community. So if you're in a position where you can speak out, if you have contacts in government, if you have contacts in the industry, please use them uh, because we have to protect uh, the planet, not just humans, but some of the other living organisms as well. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magda. So Libby and Magda are going to take some seats in the comfy chairs, and I'll moderate with these cards as soon as I get them. So while we're waiting, um, is this on? Great. So while we're waiting, I was wondering, um, Magda, could you elaborate on what a dirty electricity really is in people's homes? What's it come from? What's the source of this? dirty electricity that you were referring to in your talk, so people kind of have a sense of what that is. Um, clean electricity, it's easier if I start with clean electricity. Clean electricity is um, 60 hertz sine wave. It's 60 cycles per second here in North America. Very nice, smooth wave. <clears throat> when you start using electronic devices and energy efficient products, when power goes on and off, it tends to put a spike, a surge, uh, on, the, on top of the electricity. And so if you look at the electricity on a scope meter, uh, instead of going smooth like this, it's actually going up and down like this. And um, that's radio frequency on top of the 60 hertz sine wave. And it turns out, because it's radio frequency, it actually radiates into the room that you're in. So a computer, a plasma television set, for example, plasma TVs are notorious for this. Um, energy efficient light bulbs are pretty bad as well. And the more of these products that you have, the more energy efficient devices you have, the more dirty electricity you're going to generate. And what's really lovely about this, though, is it's a simple thing to fix. There are capacitors. There are a number of different companies now that make them. And you can simply plug this into your electrical outlet, and it will short out the high frequencies. So it'll, it'll make that electricity a lot cleaner. And we're finding that people are benefiting once that electricity is cleaned up. Audiophiles tend to know about this um, because if you have any, if you have dirty power in your home, it affects your um, stereo system. And so, if you really have a good ear, 
um, then you're going to want to clean up that electricity. And so they have something called uh, power conditioners that audiophiles use, and that will do the same thing. So it protects sensitive electronic equipment. <coughs> it also happens to benefit human health. So you're you know, killing two birds with one stone by uh, cleaning up the power uh, in your home. How about um, uh, electricity generated by solar and wind uh, generators? What about those things? You know, people try to do the right thing and they try to go green. So they buy energy efficient light bulbs, they put solar on, you know, on their roofs. Um, more and more communities are, are using wind turbines in order to um, have a more sustainable form of energy. And unfortunately what happens is when you um, have that solar power on your home, when you want to use it, you have to convert it from direct current to something called alternating current, which is your 60 cycles. And in the process of going from direct current to alternating current, you use inverters and they produce a huge amount of dirty electricity. So people who have solar collectors on their home who are actually using it not to heat water, um, but they're converting it to AC current, then they're going to have severe problems. Many of them will have ultimately health effects associated with that. However, if you have solar and you have it as direct current, if you put light bulbs in your home or appliances in your home that also use direct current so you still keep it with direct current, that's the best way to go from a health perspective and for you know, an environmental energy efficiency perspective as well. Thank you. Okay. We're going to get down and dirty here with all of these cards. All right. There's a preschool kindergarten on the property of my church, about 100, 100 to 150 feet from a cell tower that T-Mobile is converting to 5G. Just how dangerous is this to the children? How quickly will symptoms appear? Well, I'd like to start by answering that question. I happen to know about this already, and I know the person who asked me the question. Uh, the preschool is on the church grounds, and the location is only 100 to 150 feet away. There are three cell towers. There's two set cell towers actively operating there right now, and there's a third one that they are per getting permitted to build a 5G macro tower. So. This is outrageous. It's an extremely vulnerable place. I've been aware of it for years. Um, I told people at that church I prefer not to go there, and why? Uh, because of the sanctuary being so close by. And now I've learned about the preschool and the vulnerability there. So we hope to talk to the preschool, uh, head of the preschool. We've already spoken with the pastor. We, we got the plans for the uh, upgrade of the uh, macro tower from the county. The county zoning administrator gladly worked with us to get the information. We need to analyze the proposal. And when we have, uh, when we can get somebody over there to take measurements, we're going to do a time one study and look and see uh, what the exposure conditions are in the sanctuary, in the school, in the playground, in the places where people spend time. Uh, the distance is, as Dr. Hava said, is, is it at the level where it is pose, poses a hazard. And so, and with 5G, the signals are going to be more powerful and create a greater distance of hazard. So uh, we don't yet know, have any um, experience with exposure to 5G. And we don't even have equipment to measure for it right now. So uh, it's a big question, but it definitely will be more hazardous. The, the result, the health problems that will be uh, resulting from that are the ones that Meg has already outlined. Neurological effects, cancers over time, and uh, neurological disease and disorders. Libby, is there anything that these people can do to uh, potentially avert this from happening? Unfortunately, these uh, contracts are long-term leases, and I've already told the pastor to take a look at those leases, and the next time they come up for renewal, which they do usually every five years, cancel it and find other ways to support that church. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll take this one. What are gliomas, meningiomas, what is sclerosis? So 
gliomas or the glioblastoma that Magda um, elaborated and demonstrated in the talk, the glioblastoma is the highest grade of, of the primary brain tumor that originates from the brain cells. The glial cells are the uh, supportive, there's neurons and there's glial cells which are the supporting cells of the brain. And so there's four grades of glioma. The highest is the glioblastoma that she showed you on the picture that had the sort of inhomogeneous um, uh, lighting up picture. And that's when those cells grow awry and out of control. And that's a form of brain cancer. Um, the meningiomas are typically benign tumors. They arise from the meninges. So like when someone says they have meningitis, the brain lining is lined by this structure called the dura, which means hard membrane, and the meningiomas arise from the dura. And they, too, are on a spectrum of benign all the way to malignant, and we're seeing higher rates of malignant meningiomas in younger people based on the U of A study that they just looked at. What is sclerosis? Multiple sclerosis, to which she referred to in the talk, is a demyelinating disease. So those supportive cells, the myelin cells, which are glial cells that surround the neurons, that go from our brain and go into our spinal cord and innervate our limbs and body, those cells degenerate. And so sclerosis can happen in the white matter parts of the brain that are the fiber tracts, and they can also occur in the spinal cord. Can you say more about what is dirty electricity that we talked about, but how is it different than the Wi-Fi pollution? <coughs> dirty electricity is on electrical wires. Wi-Fi is through the air. So it's simply how, how we, you know, uh, are exposed to it. Uh, even though it's on the wires, it radiates into the room, but if you move wires further away from you, you're going to be exposed much less. Now, you can take Wi-Fi, and instead of to, to get onto the Internet, instead of using Wi-Fi, which is a microwave carrier through the air, you can use um, Ethernet cables or fiber optics. There's lots of different ways that you can actually um, access the Internet without having to go wirelessly. So in my home, we have um, Ethernet cables uh, everywhere. So I can you know, plug my computer in, use it, access the internet, but I'm not exposed to any kind of microwave radiation in the process. Great. How could a lay person like myself learn to do live blood tests, question mark, how expensive would it be? Well, I, anyone can do uh, a live um, blood test. Uh, you can buy a microscope, and there's some that are available for about $350, I found. Um, and they, they're pretty good. They take photographs and take video as well. All you have to do is, you know, prick your finger in a clean environment, you know, sterilized with alcohol first. Uh, put a drop onto a slide and simply put it under the microscope, and that will, you know, allow you to look at your own blood. So anyone can do it. It's really quite simple. You did not mention that 5G was used in military grade technology and was used for surveillance. You know, I try not to frighten people. Um, you know, some. You know, when when I'm attacked and I'm attacked quite often, um, I'm called a fear monger. I'm just trying to frighten people, and I'm really not trying to frighten people. I'm trying to empower everyone in the audience so that you can decide for yourself whether or not you want to be exposed to this radiation. Um, the active denial system is something the U.S. military use and they brag about. Um, it consists of a vehicle with a large um, sort of conical antenna on top of it, and they can aim the beam of microwave radiation. They use 95 gigahertz, which is the frequency. That's 95 billion cycles per second, and they can aim it at a crowd or they can aim it at an individual. And it's used for crowd control. When they turn that beam on, it causes the um, your sweat glands to bubble, to boil. So it's basically heating water, just like a microwave oven, and it's excruciatingly painful to the point that people cannot stand being in the beam of radiation. So you want to control the crowd, you aim at the crowd, they get out of the way, uh, basically. And there are videos now, um, the History Channel has one, the US um, military is you know, broadcasting this and letting people know that it's available, so it's no longer top secret um, type of weaponry. 
And it turns out that it doesn't matter how thick the clothing is that you're wearing, it actually penetrates clothing and it gets right to your sweat glands and it's excruciatingly painful. My primary concern about this um, is that it th affects your eyes. <clears throat> your eyes don't have any protection and consequently, um, if you're going to be exposed to this radiation you know, once, twice, three times, because it's so powerful, it can actually cause cataracts um, and damage to the lens of your eye. Yes, um, uh, the uh, frequencies to be used with 5G include microwave radio frequency and radi uh, millimeter wave radiation, which is what Magda was just describing uh, that has been used uh, in the military, but never commercially before, uh, and active denial is a very powerful um, transmission. With with 5G, we don't have any evidence uh, yet about the health effects from the exposure condition to be applied commercially with the 5G infrastructure. But what we do know is that part of the infrastructure involves beam forming and uh, uh, which means that these uh, signals will be transmitted very quickly, you know, almost instantaneously, and with very low latency, immediate response time to a request. And those beams will be transported, transmitted rather, from the large macro towers to fixed wireless uh, antennae around the town on buildings and so forth, and to everything that's smart out there, which isn't so smart, um, phones and buildings, smart buildings, smart homes, smart cars. These beam forming signals will be very intense and very uh, uh, powerful, not long lasting. They're not gonna be pulsing all the time, but when they have a, a lot of energy to transmit. Uh, 5G is designed to transmit heavy data. We're big textures now. And we're also uh, going to be uh, monitored so the 5G technology will collect data about people using high strength pulse signals, beam forming signals, and that data eventually end up in a data center somewhere around the United States where our personal habits uh, will be profiled. And this will, this the reason for this, one of the uh, surface reasons is marketing. They're gonna know how to market to us. Well, they're gonna know a lot about us too. So. There's a real privacy issue here and a cybersecurity issue we're talking about. But because there's no safety testing on 5G, this is a major concern. We don't know yet what the exposure is going to be. And with these small cell antennas, which are going to be placed on the rights of way along the streets, including right in front of our home, every third or fourth home, depending on the size of the, of the lots, uh, will be sighted on the right of ways um, in front of buildings so the signal can get an easily pierce the walls and get into the building. Uh, there are test cities all over the country now where this is being done. How is the microwave frequency more harmful if it's at a lower frequency than visible light? And what is the disease causing mechanism of electromagnetic fields? <clears throat> One of the arguments about microwaves is that it doesn't have enough energy. It's not ionizing radiation. It doesn't have enough energy to break chemical bonds. And um, mostly physicists will use that argument. And indeed, um, a lot of health agencies say exactly the same thing. So if it doesn't have enough energy to break a chemical bond, how can it actually cause cancer? And the answer is it, it's not the energy that's critical, it's the information that's given to the cell that's critical. So microwave radiation carries information to the cell. Cells are communicating with each other and anything that interferes with that electromagnetic communication can potentially cause damage. And one of the things we're finding in the literature, and this is now several hundred studies, more than 200 studies have shown the same thing. When you're exposed to microwave radiation, there's an increase in reactive oxygen species in your body. And reactive oxygen is created by ionizing radiation. So the question is, how can it be increasing when we don't have that power to break chemical bonds? And it turns out that we have repair mechanisms that are turned off. 
And so when we're respiring, we produce uh, reactive oxygen species. They're, you know, they're a signaling mechanism, but if you have too much of it, it can really be damaging and it could cause cancer. So those reactive oxygen species are what I think is causing the cancer. And the reason they're increasing is because our ability, the body's ability to correct them, to neutralize them is no longer there. So it's a totally different process than with ionizing radiation. Thank you. Are there any refuge, refuges, ref, ref, refuges <laughs> for people with EHS? Yes, there are. There's a place in um, Arizona called um, Snowflake. Thank you, Snowflake. It just slipped my mind. I think it's the microwave radiation in here. Um, there's Snowflake, Arizona, where um, people who are electrically hypersensitive will go. There's a place in West Virginia called Green Bank where they have very large radio telescopes that are listening to microwaves, um, absorbing microwaves from outer space and trying to understand um, what messages they're giving us. And because of that, uh, those large antennas, a cell phone will interfere with communication. So around Green Bank, West Virginia, there's a 10-mile exclusion zone. There's no radio stations. You can't use cell phones. You have, can't have any cordless or wireless um, devices in your home because it interferes with that. So people who are sensitive go there for a few weeks, a few months, and some actually go to live there to protect themselves against the radiation. Next question. We haven't used our crystals and monoatomic minerals seen in Krillian photography and EMF devices in our sciences. Why? I think that means why haven't we used our... I don't understand the question. Is, well, those are considered alternative uh, things, and the medical establishment does not take it seriously. Okay. Uh, the company named Safe Living Technologies, SLT.com in Ontario, passes on to its clients the following advice. Any protective clothing against EMR is not recommended. One example is that the hats used for EMF protection have silver in it. That is the silver, that is that the silver may go into the head if we are wearing this silver hat on our heads and so it's not recommended. Would you speak to the protective clothing in general and the silver hats as well? Thank you. The silver is actually coated with cotton so the silver isn't immediately adjacent to your body um, and silver has been put into clothing particularly clothing used by the military because it's an antibiotic it it kills bacteria silver is really toxic to bacteria so and they put it in socks to keep socks fresher so this silver is available in fabric. It's being put into fabric specifically to protect against microwave radiation. And in China, one of the things, when they had the policy of one child per family, um, they really wanted to make sure that their offspring were healthy. And so women would wear an apron uh, over their clothing to protect the fetus. And so if you wear the silver, not directly next to your skin, but over top of clothing, it can actually reduce your exposure to microwaves. But as I already mentioned, some people are so sensitive that this, this fabric um, just makes them sick. So you have to try it for yourself to see if it will protect you, if you're, if you're aware of how you react when you're exposed to the radiation. Next question, how safe are the home monitoring cameras and are shungite and copper deflectors effective for EMFs? There is some evidence that shungite protects against EMF. Um, I work with people who are electrically hypersensitive and although I'm sensitive, I can't sense when I'm exposed. So I can go into an, a polluted environment and I won't know until after the fact um, you know, that I'm exposed. But people who are electrically sensitive tell me that shungite helps them enormously. And um, with some people, once again, the shungite can make it worse. So the response to any of this technology is incredibly individualistic. What works for you know person A may not work for person B. What was the first part of that? Um, they wanted to know if the um, wireless cameras, home cameras, were safe. Anything wireless is it says wireless, which means it has to transmit through the air, and it's going to be microwaves that it's using to transmit. So anything wireless that you have in your home, whether it's a you know, 
wireless security system, anything wireless is going to expose you to microwave radiation. And one of the things I recommend people do is they buy a, a small um, radio frequency meter. It's called Acousticom 2. It's available at lessemf.com, which is a company in New York that's been selling these products for a long time, about $200. Once you have one of those, you can walk around and you can tell exactly what you're exposed to. So it's a really good, what was that? It's less, triple W, dot, L-E-S-S, E-M-F, dot, com. Less, E-M-F, dot, com. The name of the meter is Acousticom. Acousticom, meaning you can hear a sound. Acousticom 2, which is a smaller one. There's Acousticom 1, which is bigger, and I don't recommend it. Um, it's about the same size as this particular meter. This happens to be from Safe Living Technologies. And it gives you a sound, and it gives you colors, and it gives you a relative scale as to how high the, your exposure is. Really recommend that people buy this because it's one way that you can tell whenever you're exposed. And the closer you get to the source, the higher the radiation, so you can actually determine what's causing it. Is there a way to protect oneself from iPads or, or even uh, laptops held on your lap? I recommend um, that if you're using your iPad or your, your tablet or um, computer on your lap to download information, then like, let's say you're downloading a video, for example, I recommend you download it and then you put that laptop or the uh, tablet into airplane mode. And as long as it's in airplane mode, you're not exposed. So it, while things are downloading or uploading, that's when your exposure is going to be highest. But if you turn things to airplane mode, then you're fine. So for example, if you use it to get your email, download all your email, turn it to airplane mode, you know, answer everything, turn it back on, and then send all the information. So you could really minimize your exposure, even if you have Wi-Fi, just by turning it off. Thank you. I have two little dogs with microchips. They are the first dogs that I've had since 1976 that have seizures. Do you have any thoughts about microchips? Microchips have a really small range of uh, radiation that they emit. Uh, when they started putting microchips into dairy cattle, for example, they found that there were um, there was necrosis, uh, dead cells immediately around the microchip uh, because it was emitting. So it depends on on what type of microchip you have, but there could be a small amount of radiation uh, going to the animal. Um, but it's a very close range. It's not massive in any way. While we're on that topic, um, how do you feel about Bluetooth hearing aids and Bluetooth headphones? Bluetooth is just another form of um, microwave radiation. Um, the hearing aids that they're making that are wireless are causing headaches in people. When you have two hearing aids and they're communicating with each other, that communication is going right through your brain. So if it comes to you know using a cell phone versus having a hearing aid that's wireless, um, the hearing aid is much, much worse. That same for the Bluetooth um, headsets that people, you know, the little white ones that sort of stick down. Whenever I see someone who has that in an airport, for example, I'll go up to them and I'll say, by the way, do you realize you're, you know, um, you're, that part of your brain is getting microwaved? And sometimes we get a good response, sometimes not so good. But the real problem with them is that they're always in the same location. So those cells are always being affected. If you could at least move it you know, from one ear to the other, it would minimize damage because your body has an amazing ability to heal, but not if it's constantly exposed. How about the Bluetooth in our cars and our hands-free phones and using the Bluetooth in our cars? That's constantly on in many instances. Well, if you can turn the Bluetooth off, that's what I would recommend. Um, People who are sensitive can't drive in a car that has Bluetooth. Can't you know? Can't have drive in a car if someone's using a cell phone. Um, they even have difficulty if they're going past an antenna. And one of the things you can buy now, and I, although I think it might be illegal to put it on the windshield, although people are doing it, there's a clear um, 
uh, plastic that you can put on your windows that will shield you against the radiation. So if you're extremely sensitive, you can put it on all the windows. The metal will help reflect some of that. But if you put it on all the windows, you'll find that um, you can tolerate it much more because you're not as exposed. The problem is your cell phone won't work in your car. So if you need your cell phone, a friend of mine put this on his car and his GPS didn't work. So <laughs> there's some drawbacks. I have heard that people are getting sick from electric cars, such as Teslas and the Nissans. Do you believe that electric and hybrid cars are harming the people who drive them? Yes, um, electric cars have a battery. Usually the battery is kept in the back seat, and that's usually where you put your infant. So the highest electric field and magnetic field is going to be where that battery is, and then the cable that takes um, that juice to the engine. Um, so if you're sitting immediately on top of the battery or very close to the battery, the magnetic fields are very high. Now, what Tesla, what Elon Musk should do is simply shield uh, the battery and the cable going to the engine. There's something called mu metal that will shield magnetic fields. And, you know, those cars are sufficiently expensive that they could add a little bit more to the cost and protect the people who are in them. What can you tell us about light bulbs? Can you give us some general guidelines about what are the best light bulbs to have in our homes now? Um, we did studies with light bulbs because um, people who are electrically sensitive told me that universally they can't tolerate fluorescent light bulbs, the compact fluorescent ones or the tube. And so we started doing some research to find out what they emit. And it turns out the fluorescent light bulbs uh, emit ultraviolet radiation. They emit radio frequency radiation. They produce dirty electricity. And they have a quality of light that's really unhealthy. They also flicker. So your eyes constantly getting this flicker. Um, so fluorescent light bulbs are horrible. Uh, we then tested LED light bulbs, light emitting diodes. And we found that they varied enormously. However, most of them have the same problems that um, C CFL light bulbs have, compact fluorescent light bulbs. The only thing they don't have is mercury. So if you break you know, a compact fluorescent light bulb, you've got a potential mercury contamination in that environment. Um, there are manufacturers now, if anyone wants to make a lot of money, if you can find some technical people who can produce clean light bulbs, I will promote them uh, because we are desperately in need of clean light bulbs. I have, in my house, I have uh, virtually all incandescent light bulbs because they're the cleanest uh, that are available. They're the healthiest that are available. They're not energy efficient, uh, but from a health perspective, they're the best ones we have. And I might add that there's now some um, evidence that macular degeneration is now increased with exposure to um, these new LED light bulbs. And so there's um, quite a few articles on the internet if you just Google safety of LEDs, and it, it is potentially um, accelerating macular degeneration, which is the, the retina undergoing degenerative changes because of the refresh rate of the, um, of the bulb. Um, what happens to radio frequency meter, a meter, when it's exposed to the 5G above the range of one meter? Does it show out of range or nothing at all? Well, I guess, I, I guess that it should be rephrased. They want to know what happens if you're measuring 5G from a meter, where will you be able to measure it with a meter and will, be, will there be a drop-off point at which you might be at a safe distance? I think that's... Okay, when it comes to any kind of radio frequency or low frequency electromagnetic fields, it drops off exponentially with distance. So the further away you are from it, the, the better it is. We don't have meters currently that are financially affordable to measure 5G. The frequency range is just far too high. So we can't measure 5G until you know someone develops a meter that uh, is affordable. And somebody asked how far is a meter? Uh, in terms of distance, I think it's about three feet. Um, are there any studies um, using microwave, uh, any, any studies showing the effects of microwave ovens? When it comes to microwave ovens, um, I've tested quite a few of them uh, to see if they leak microwaves, and I've only tested one that didn't leak, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, but if you, if you want to find out um, if your microwave oven leaks, what I recommend you do, you don't have to have a meter. If you have a meter, that's great. Um, you can take your cell phone, and if you get cell phone reception in your kitchen, put your cell phone in your microwave oven, close the door, but don't turn the microwave on because your cell phone will explode. 
um, call your cell phone, and if the cell phone rings, it means the microwaves are actually getting through to the glass. Um, with a meter, you can pick it up. And in most places, we can be from here, if the microwave is here, right to that wall, and you'll be picking up a screaming microwave uh, radiation uh, from that. When it comes to microwaving food, uh, one of the things that happens is our enzymes are denatured to a certain degree. So the quality of the food after it's microwaved from a nutritional perspective is, is somewhat less, depending on how long it's in the oven. Um, the food does not hold on to a microwave, so by ingesting it, you're not ingesting microwaves or anything of that nature. Um, Magda, I was interested about exercising in, indoors since um, we're all exercise aficionados. Would you say that all electrical equipment, like an elliptical trainer or any of these things that you see in hotel gyms, are harmful in terms of dirty electricity? If they're plugged into an electric outlet, they're going to have a magnetic field. And if they're variable speed, they're going to have dirty electricity. So that's something for exercise physiologists to look at in detail, I would say. Exactly, yeah. OK. Um, we've exhausted all of our questions. Are there any burning questions from the audience that we want to entertain? Yes. Okay, the first, the first part of that question, that was a fairly long question, the first part of that question was when you turn on your computer, you get a lot of microwave uh, um, Wi-Fi wi signals uh, from your neighbors, for example. Um, your computer is incredibly efficient at picking up a signal. And the signals that you're getting from your neighbors uh, aren't going to be nearly as powerful as the signal you're generating in your own home. So by, minim by reducing your exposure in your own home, yes, you're still going to be exposed to a certain degree, but it won't be as much as if you're generating it. So even though you're getting signals from neighbors, to minimize your own exposure by going wired is still a, a good idea. Um, and once again, in your own home, you can shield yourself from some of that radiation if you feel you need to do that. Now, there was a second part to the question about globally what, what's the magnetic field doing? The way that it's transmitted globally, is there something that's happening and affecting us? Well, well last night we, discussed, um, we went out to dinner two nights ago, and there's a thing called the Schumann Residence. This is a fascinating topic that you can look up online, and it's basically the Earth's natural electromagnetic field. And that Schumann Residence has been written about by philosophers and scholars, physicists, and it's it's basically the fact that our Earth functions miraculously with these biorhythms of animals and plants and the ocean. And the hypothesis now is is that all of this radio frequency is affecting our tying in our perception to the Schumann resonance. And it's not only affecting us, but it's affecting animals, whales, etc. I don't know, Magda, if you can elaborate on that. The, the Schumann resonance has a cycle of roughly eight cycles per second, eight, 16 harmonics of that, 32. And this is what we all evolved with. And it, when you're within the Earth's um, atmosphere when you're not on a spacecraft, for example, orbiting the Earth, or you're not in an entirely shielded room, um, then that Schumann resonance synchronizes your circadian rhythm. And so anything that interferes with your ability to be exposed to the Schumann resonance will interfere with that circadian rhythm. And I think that's one of the reasons people are having such a hard time sleeping, uh, because they're overly stimulated by other frequencies. There's also some evidence that the Schumann resonance is changing slightly. It's, it's no longer at 8. It's closer to 10 now. And there's evidence that the Earth's magnetic field is actually getting weaker. And when the Earth's magnetic field gets weaker, it allows more solar radiation in. Now, this, this weakening of the magnetic field doesn't have anything to do with our wireless technology. It's just a natural process that the Earth goes through periodically. And in the past, the magnetic field has flipped. And during these flips, we've had major extinctions of the dinosaurs and, and various other things. So the concept here is that once once the magnetic field gets so low, there's so much solar radiation coming in that it causes DNA damage. Uh, and unfortunately, we're getting to that low part. And within the next 
few hundred, few thousand years, there's going to be another flip, and that's going to be biologically active, but it has nothing to do, as far as I know, with our microwave exposure. I just want to add to that that there are questions starting to be asked now by physicists, biophysicists, looking at atmospheric conditions. Uh, there was a, a comment letter sent uh, responding to an article on planetary health and uh, saying that the effects of cell phone radiation is now being detected in the atmosphere at higher levels and it's, the levels are still growing. The latest data they reported was from 2010, which did show a marked increase, in, uh, change rather, in atmospheric conditions that correlate with cell phone radiation. Uh, the other part of that is that wireless requires electricity. It's powered by electricity. And we still primarily are a fossil fuel world. So these fossil fuel plants are uh, releasing CO2 in the air. And if there's more wireless demand, there's more power demand and more CO2 release. Do you have an opinion on this green initiative that's sort of a, a bandwagon thing for many politicians, either of you? Only to say that wireless is a factor in the green uh, plan, uh, and I haven't read the details of it yet. But wireless is often a, a silent partner in in uh, in these kinds of visionary uh, plans for the future. Thank you. Um, is there a, is there a safe TV, Magda, that we can have in our homes and still watch basketball? Um, there is a little meter that you can buy. It's called a light B, L-I-G-H-T-B-E-E. -E -E. It's manufactured by a company in Quebec, and for $100, I think, 99 Canadian, which is about $20 American. Um, so you can buy this and point it at your TV screen, point it at a light bulb, and it'll tell you if it's flickering. It'll make a sound, and it, that sound is proportional to the flickering. And I really recommend people buy the secondary meter because if you're staring at a TV screen or a computer screen that's flickering like this, it's going to be ultimately bad for your health because that's affecting your neurological system. It's affecting your eyes. Uh, LEDs tend to be much better than plasma. Plasma is absolutely horrible. Any other burning questions from the audience? In the, yes, here. Oh, thank you for asking. Um, we have uh, a couple of issues we're promoting and talking about the effects of electromagnetic fields and EMR on health. Uh, number one, we're working with the city and the county. We've met with them. We uh, understand the effects of 5G rules that have prohibited them from planning and zoning authorities, so they can't protect us. And we're promoting fiber optics to the premises as an alternative to 5G wireless. There's information at the back about that. There's a little postcard that lays out about 13 reasons why fiber to the premises is better than 5G. It's uh, more reliable. It's faster. It doesn't become obsolete, so you don't, you don't need another generation of it. It's there. And it's available right now, the city of Tucson. By the way, it's also not hackable. The city of Tucson has 500 miles of fiber, and uh, the wireless industry is taking it over as backhaul for the wireless signals, their uh, antenna arrays they have operating right now. So the city described, the way the city talked about it last week was that Tucson is planning to be a smart city, and they are going to be using fiber for city communications, for city signals. And they didn't go much further than that. But when I talked to the IT director for the city, Hal Hewitt, he told me that if if they try to put in a fiber alternative to 5G, they're going to encounter stiff resistance from the wireless carriers. And my attitude was, make my day. I think they should. <laughs> no, we, we'd like to go fiber. You know, there was just a report from the city of Sacramento, and this is very telling. Earlier this month, an independent study was made of Sacramento, which is one of the 5G test cities in the United States. They uh, find that there are very few people subscribing to Verizon Home Services. So they're not, if they don't have subscribers, they won't be able to finance the construction of these 5G, thousands and thousands of 5G small cell antennas throughout the neighborhoods where the people's homes are. 
Um, the other thing they've found is that 5G actually costs about 64% more than initial investment capitalization of fiber. So that's a very good report. It's early enough on that it may get people's attention. And by the way, we have a book at the back which goes into great detail about five, uh, uh, fiber. Uh, it's written by Tim Sheckley from University of Colorado. It's called Reinventing Wires, and I highly recommend it. Uh, we sell it for 10 bucks, and I have more copies if you want more, more copies. I want to say something else, too. Uh, we also are promoting restoration of local control. The, uh, there's a bill in Congress that would revoke the 5G FCC rules. Uh, it's received 30 co-sponsors, and on, it's on the House side. Anna Esho from Silicon Valley introduced that. Isn't that interesting? Um, there also was a bill introduced in the House 7236 in the Congress, the radiation the Radio Frequency Radiation Site Safety Information Act. Uh, this bill is ugly. It would grant the industry immunity from civil liability should there be injury. You know, civil liability plays an important part in injury prevention. And when somebody is harmed, they have cause to sue. There are 30 tort claims uh, brought by people who, lawyers for people who have developed a brain tumor and they believe it's from a cell phone, they're in the D.C. Superior Court right now. If this bill passes, it, it would probably prevent these courts, uh, bills, from, uh, cases from ever going to court. I'm not totally up on hearing aids. I recently had my hearing tested and um, I talked to, you know, the doctor who was doing the testing and he's very interested in the various types of hearing aids. So we're going to be doing a study testing different manufacturers and, you know, whether you're communicating with, you know, an object on the table versus the hearing aids are communicating with themselves. We're going to be doing a study on that and releasing it to the public. But currently I just haven't tested enough hearing aids to know. I think that, you know, at this point, there there really is uh, a difficult conversation. I think if the vagal nerve stimulators for seizures and for chronic pain have a real use, um, they're now looking at vagal nerve stimulators for sleep apnea, and then they're implanting things for sleep apnea as an alternative to CPAP machines. You know, my, my, my uh, perspective as a physician is, is that, um, you know, Right now, we need pacemakers to have a good cardiac rhythm, and I don't see a way around it. Um, they communicate wirelessly, and I don't think we really have a choice there. The vagal nerve stimulators that prevent seizures, the same thing. They're extremely useful. I think that um, sleep apnea, on the, on the other hand, if you, you absolutely cannot use a CPAP machine and you've exhausted all of the therapies, um, I would be very hesitant to have a vagal nerve stimulator implanted for sleep apnea. Um, I, I would try to, you know, avoid all those things. The other theory, however, and this is, of course, this is alternative, um, but uh, Paul in the back will tell you that he's seen people with conditions like Parkinson's disease, sleep apnea, um, even cardiac dysrhythmias who live in extremely clean environments um, normalize. and. You know, based on kind of some of the stuff that we've seen, I wouldn't doubt that um, because the body does have a potential to heal itself. And when we think about it, we are living in an unnatural environment right now from what we're used to. I just wanted to say that the uh, deep brain stimulators are not protected from signal. I, I know a man who suffers from cerebral palsy. He's on the U.S. Access Board, which looks after the needs of disabled people. Uh, and he told everyone at a recent meeting that because he has a deep brain stimulator, he avoids people with cell phones, he avoids antennas, he asks for the overhead lights to be turned off when he's in a public hearing like that. He's well aware that, that the, his uh, deep brain stimulator could be uh, disabled by an exogenous signal. Um, there are capacitors that you can buy. There's. I mentioned there's several different companies that make them, but you can buy them through lessemf.com. Again, they sell those, so www.lessemf.com.
emf.com, and the ones that we've tested that we used in our research were called um, the Graham Stetzer filters, GS filters, and they come with um, a little meter that you can plug into the into the outlet, and that's a, a, a micro surge meter. So if you buy a filter and the meters and plug them in, you can tell how many you might need for your home. You can put them in yourself, it's easy enough, or you can have hire someone who will come in and, and do the job for you. Yes, they will work in hotel rooms and some people travel with them. They take about two or three with them. And when they travel, they plug them into their hotel room. The problem is they often forget them and leave them there, so they have to buy a few extras. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight and thank you for your attendance and supporting the Electromagnetic Safety Alliance of Tucson, Arizona. Thank you, thank you Dr. Havas, for coming. Thank you.